Peter Sheps and I'm here at Studios La Fabrique uh, in France. I'm just finishing up this year's Mix with the Masters seminar, which has been excellent. Uh, but for those of you who are not here, we got some questions submitted online and I'm going to answer some of them right now. So, here's the first question. From Guillaume Payetin, and I remember this man from last year, um, excellent engineer from France. Hello Andrew. Hello Guillaume. I have a hundred questions, but I'll go for this one. Could you give us the trick you use to pitch down the lead vocal, like if you were slowing down a tape on the track I'll Keep Coming, of the amazing Low Roar album you have recently mixed? Thanks. Um, thank you, Guillaume, for mentioning that. Uh, this band Low Roar from Iceland uh, on my label, and it is an album that um, co-produced and mixed. Really proud of it. There are a lot of vocal effects on that record, and there's sort of a standard octave down vocal which is on quite a few of the songs which we used uh, a few different things. Um, an octaver guitar pedal, a plug-in of an octaver guitar pedal, but there's one in particular that Guillaume is asking me about, which unfortunately I did not do. That was a track I got from the artist. Um, I would assume that they used one of the pitch shifters we talked about before, but it's also filtered. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot of top end. And if you don't know what we're talking about, I highly recommend listening to the record because it's fantastic. And I'm not just saying that. It's, uh, it's been proven in, well, it hasn't really. Anyway, we like it. But that particular effect I didn't do. But I'm assuming it was just a standard octaver, uh, but it's also quite filtered, uh, which is cool. There you go. From Fred Mustachi, um, who was also here last year. Uh, hi, Andrew. Hi, Fred. According to you, does a parallel compression setup could be as sophisticated in the box and out of the box? What about hybrid systems using DAW plugins and console gears? Thank you. Well, Fred, as you may remember last year, we were mixing completely on the console using outboard gear. Starting the day after the seminar, uh, I started transitioning away from the gear and into the box, and I am now mixing 100% in the box. And along the way, I transitioned from 100% out through using lots of hardware inserts to have the gear set up but using the Pro Tools mixer, um, and then slowly got rid of the gear. So the answer is absolutely yes, it can be exactly as sophisticated. Um, the way I've built my in-the-box template is by looking at the setup I was using outside of the box, and every single parallel chain I've either recreated in Pro Tools or found something else that does the same sort of job or decided I no longer need something to do that job. And then since I've been in the box, there have been quite a few chains I've come up with um, that have only been in the box. But there is no reason, especially in Pro Tools with the delay compensation, that you can't have a really sophisticated setup. I think I had 40 hardware inserts when I started doing the hybrid setup. So. You can do any combination. It's whatever sounds good to you and whatever works. Um, and we've had an interesting week this week where we actually mixed a song that we tracked this week once on the console and once in the box in the same day. And, uh, and the mixes were very similar but very, very different. And it's also a very different process. So setting up the, the gear and the plugins, that's trivial. It's figuring out how you can get what you want to come out of the speakers, but you can absolutely do it either way or somewhere in the middle. Thank you, Fred. Next, from Buddha Gweds. Um, hi there, Andrew. First of all, thanks for all the inspiration you continuously give us. You're very welcome. Uh, do you use a room mic on electric guitar? If so, do you pan it the same as the close mic or the opposite? And which mics do you usually use? And what's your go-to mic placement when recording electric guitar? Thanks a lot. Okay, I'm going to work backwards on this. Um, when I'm recording electric guitar, I almost never set up a room mic unless the guitar player uh, specifically requests it. The way I record is I take an SM57 and a Sennheiser 421 and I physically tape them together, which makes the diaphragms be completely lined up. And also you only have to use one mic stand, because usually by the time you get around to putting mics on the guitar, you've already used all the mic stands on the drums, so it really helps to have it on one. Plus the mics never move relative to each other. And I tend to put the microphones straight on, right in the middle of the cone. And uh, every once in a while you'll have a cone in a cabinet that is blown up, 
just move to a different cone and usually you'll never even hear the one that's crackling. To me, that is the way to get a sound that is the closest to what's coming out of the amplifier. It just sounds right to me when I come into the control room after being out in the studio listening to the amp. There are lots of people who record with ribbon mics and with room mics or with a ribbon room a little further away. I've been tracking some guitars recently where on the opposite side of the room where the amps are, I was miking a piano with some ribbon mics. So they're sort of set up for a piano, but they're all the way across the room. And I started recording those as room mics on the guitar, and it's really cool. So whenever I try and set up a room mic, it doesn't work at all. But whenever there's just another microphone, it usually works great. I think maybe the key for me is it should be a microphone that's pointed away from the guitar amps, and then it actually really helps me with the size. Um, as far as how I use them when I'm mixing, sometimes I pan it exactly the same as the guitar because it's meant to be part of the tone and you don't really want it to sound separate. Sometimes I will pan it opposite. Usually in that case, it's because the guitar would be by itself on one side. And when you listen in headphones, it's very disconcerting when there isn't anything in one speaker. So I'll use the room or create a spring reverb or something like that to put on the other side so that you don't notice it and the guitar still sounds like it's all the way on one side, but you get a little bit of information on the other. So, I hope that covers that. Next from Cosbos. Um, would you put an analog bus compressor in parallel or let the whole mix pass through? Thanks a lot. Um, at the moment, I don't use an analog bus compressor, but I'm assuming you're just talking about a compressor that's on the entire mix. Generally, I do have a compressor. I use a 33609 or a plug-in of a Neve 33609 on the mix bus, and the mix just goes through it. It's a very particular sound. I use the 100 millisecond release time, and it just has a character that's very special and it really changes the feel of the drums and vocals as it goes through the compressor. And I don't do that parallel on the whole mix. That said, I do have stereo parallel compressors set up that get just about every instrument in the mix and then they're blended in. But all of that goes together while I'm getting the stereo mix and then that stereo mix goes through a compressor. So. I have lots of parallel compressors, and some of them only get one thing, some of them are mono, but most of them get multiple instruments, and a lot of them are stereo. So the answer is yes, but not on the mix. From Chris Dover, um, Andrew, I'm a huge fan, thank you. If you had to choose three frequencies for EQing rock guitars for the rest of your career, what frequencies would you choose and why? Well, let me have some coffee from this fine mug while I think about that. That's a very impossible question to answer. Um, but that said, I would say that usually somewhere down around 150 to 200 hertz is where the thump of the cabinet comes on a heavy guitar. So I would definitely want to be able to EQ around there. Usually somewhere in the 1.5K to 2.5K is where the tone is, and the more distorted the guitar gets, the more important those frequencies are for me to be able to hear the notes, because that's usually below the really noisy part of the guitar. And then I suppose somewhere between 5K and 10K, um, it really just depends on the amp, and that's where the really fizzy white noise part of a distorted guitar would happen. And I'm Assuming by rock guitars, we're talking about the more distorted stuff. As the guitar cleans up, the frequencies then become much more dependent upon the kind of guitar and the way the part is being played. Um, but for a rhythm guitar that's playing chords that are distorted, those are kind of the three frequency ranges I would look at. And if I have to pick frequencies, let's say 180, uh, 1.8K, and 5.8K. I don't know. That's some frequencies. Next is from Orlando Greenbush. Uh, Mr. Sheps, will you or have you considered mentoring an engineer as a disciple to pass your knowledge from one generation to another? And if yes is your answer, what qualifications would the disciple need to have? I've never considered having a disciple. Um, it's a very interesting word to use for it. Um, I have tried to have interns, um, which is basically the same thing, someone to come in and just learn while I'm working. 
When I'm working, I tend to work alone and I work bizarre hours and I take breaks and I'm constantly going from one thing to the next and it's very hard to schedule and it's very strange to me. So, my choice for how to mentor is to do things like the Mix with the Masters seminar and I also teach a class in Los Angeles and I do as many interviews as people want me to do. I mean, I, I feel as though I've been very lucky to learn a lot of techniques uh, from watching all the people I've worked with over the years and so I definitely want to give people that opportunity uh, but for the way my workflow is, especially while I'm mixing, it doesn't make sense to do it personally. So um, I would say come to France because it's awesome. And then another great thing about doing the seminars here is it's not just a one-on-one -on -one thing. There are 15 people who all interact and we all learn from each other. So um, there's quite a bit to learn. I mean, I learn a ton here. So yeah, there are lots of different ways you can kind of get the same mentoring that used to happen more in recording studios. Uh, and I think it's part of why programs like this are so popular now. Um, but it is an important thing to do and no one is allowed to come do it with me by themselves, so sorry. But I shouldn't say no one, but it doesn't happen very often. Okay, moving on. Thomas, um, what are your favorite Eurorack modules and to what use? I love Eurorack modules. So uh, what Thomas is referring to is it's a particular format for modular synthesizers and it was a format that a German company called Depfer made popular, it's got to be 15 years ago now or something like that. Um, and it sort of started the renaissance in modular synthesizer builders because now instead of people who wanted to build effects having to decide if they would make it a guitar pedal or a rack mount piece of gear, they have a format where it has a common power supply so you don't have to design power supplies which means you don't have to be approved by lots of international agencies because of the power supplies um, and it made a lot of really creative people be able to develop uh, these modules and I use it for synthesis, I also use it quite a bit for processing sound. Um, I love the dope for phasers, um, they're really cool sounding and I love manual phasing so you bounce the drums through the phasers and you crank it exactly how it should go with the song. Um, I love the analog systems echo uh, it's a great stereo delay, really, really cool sounding. It turns out it's a digital delay, but it really sounds like an analog one. Um, I love the Klee sequencer, which is a kit. I bought one fully made, um, but it's just a crazy 16-step CV and gate sequencer that allows you to do additive sequencing on the fly, and it's too hard to explain right now. Um, I love a lot of the make noise modules. Um, the Phonogene is incredible and does things that I don't even know what it's doing half the time, but you just plug in a bunch of control voltages, sample something, and you're off. Uh, really creative, and I just love doing it because it's super creative, um, it's incredibly flexible, there's never a point where you want to patch something and you can't get to it because you can get to everything. And also I love it because there's no screen, you can't check your email. So you just use the modular for hours and hours on end, and then shut it off and go in the house and when you turn it on the next day it's exactly the same. So there are a million modules that I love that I haven't mentioned but those are, those are a few. Thanks for that. Always like to be able to talk about modulars. Uh, Daniel Jason Booth. Hi Andrew, uh, what typical philosophical steps would you take to get a mix loud without it becoming brittle or lacking bottom end in the box? Um, whew, it's it's hard to say. I mean, the biggest thing is the more you compress a mix, the less bottom end it will have because com most, unless you have a side chain on the compressor to take the low end out of the detector, most compressors love bottom end and that's where most of the energy is in a mix. So really the key to that is just controlling how much level goes into that compressor and you make a trade-off between the character of the mix because of how the compressor is grabbing transients and drums and things like that and how much it's killing the bass and you just find a sweet spot. Um, and I don't really think about it much anymore, I just am listening and realize oh no, the, my bass is getting eaten up so then I immediately pull down my mix a little bit and it 
expands back out and sometimes I'll think like, oh, the drums aren't pumping enough, so I'll push the level up. So it's just a little dance you have to do. The other key is, of course, EQ after the compressor. I add a lot of low end to my mixes after the compressor. In terms of brittle, I think that really goes back to the sounds of the individual instruments in the mix. I spend a lot of time getting rid of mid-range frequencies that are bothering me in cymbals and guitars and even vocals where I'll use a notch filter and just find the really annoying frequency and get rid of it. And if you get rid of it with a narrow notch, then you're taking care of a problem but without making the instruments dull. So you can still have a really bright mix that isn't brittle. But I think that you have to do individually, sort of, and find it as you go. Um, and the other kind of brittle is when you just distort the mix. I mean, my mixes are full of square waves, but I like to think that they're pleasing sounding square waves instead of brittle ones. So some people might disagree. Um, but basically, that's my, my philosophy about it. Thanks, Daniel. Our next question is from Angelo Boltini. Can you list some different effects you get out of parallel compression? Do you listen to those parallel tracks in solo? And do you ever use EQ in the same way or in conjunction? First of all, I never do parallel EQ. I EQ something because that's the way I want it to sound. The closest I get to that, I suppose, is using something like the McDSP Active EQ, where the EQ changes based on the frequency content of the thing I'm EQing. But I would never do it parallel. Every once in a while, I will split an instrument. Let's say I've got a, uh, a drum loop, and I want to deal with the kick drum separately than the top end percussion that's in the loop. I'll make a copy of the loop and sort of put a crossover kind of thing so I can really work on the low end separately from the top end. But that's not really parallel EQ, so I don't do that. I never really listen to the parallel tracks in solo because... First of all, I don't care what they sound like because I'm never going to hear them by themselves, but mostly because what they sound like on their own has nothing to do with what they sound like when you blend them in. The whole idea of parallel compression is if you put a compressor on, let's say, a snare drum and you put it on the insert, the compressor reacts to the transients and it turns the transients down and it leaves alone all of the lower level content. So you've got your RMS level of the snare drum, you've got your transient level. Putting a compressor right on the snare drum brings the transients down towards the RMS and then you can use makeup gain to turn it back up. When you use parallel compression, normally you're compressing a lot more than you would get away with on an insert. So you're really kind of smashing it. And then what you're doing as you blend that in is you're actually bringing the RMS level up to meet the transient. So the sound of the transient doesn't change, but you're making the instrument louder. And it changes the way things are sustaining. But it also, because what you're blending in has such a, an envelope to it because of the attack and release of the compressor, and they're usually moving quite a bit, um, is you really change the character of how the thing feels, how the vocal feels, how aggressive it is, um, how much the drums are pumping. And you can make a song feel like it's faster or slower depending on the type of parallel compression and how much of it you use. So um, I've got up to maybe 15 different parallel compressors on a mix and they're all used for different combinations of instruments. I don't have any idea what they sound like individually. I just know that when I blend them in, they work really well. I've never actually gone and EQ'd the parallel compression um, because it either works or it doesn't. If it doesn't work, I just choose a different compressor because there's so many choices, especially working in the box. Um, so I think, I think that's that for parallel compression. Here's our last question from Christopher Malle. Uh, you have mentioned that McDSP Dynamic EQ has saved you from having to do EQ riding in your recent projects. Uh, yes, this in particular was on a uh, Jake Bug record. Um, when Jake sings loud, the frequency content of his voice really changes, and the active EQ let me sort of set up two different EQs, but instead of me having to manually automate, it did it automatically. As soon as certain frequencies got above a certain level, then the EQ would change. Um, so back to the question. I'm wondering if you could go into some details of how you use this tool and if you found any other tools equally as valuable and time saving for things like level riding or overlapping frequencies between tracks. Do you use multiband processing too? Thanks so much. Um, so multiband processing, I usually don't do, and the reason is because if you have a multiband compressor, unless you're using something like the Waves uh, linear multiband, the crossovers aren't phase coherent. 
And what that means is as soon as you do a parallel process that doesn't have the multiband, then you start to get phase cancellations and it starts to sound really, really weird. So as much as I love multiband compressors because of how exact you can be about what you're doing, it's really, really difficult to use them with parallel compression. And I would much rather use parallel compression than multiband compression. Um, the dynamic EQ is very different from a multiband compressor because it's a standard EQ and what happens is instead of having a VCA that turns down certain frequency ranges, it's basically as if it used the detector circuit to turn the boost and cut knob up and down. So if you find a frequency that when someone is singing loud is really starting to poke out, uh, like a mid-range frequency let's say, and it starts to get too much, but when they're singing quietly uh, the voice isn't present enough, what you can do is EQ in the mid-range that you need for the voice to be present and then set the threshold on the active EQ in that exact same frequency range and tell it to turn down that frequency when uh, the voice gets louder in that range. And what it really does is it means that you're going to EQ the quiet voice and the way I had it set up on the Jake Bug songs was that when he was singing loud, that part of the voice was fine and sounded great, so it basically stopped EQing. So it went from plus, I don't know, plus four at two point something K to zero at two point something K. So it almost bypasses the EQ as you go. And in terms of, you know, how to use it, I think basically if you just read the manual for that plugin, it's a brilliant plugin, um, and you just think of it sort of like a multiband compressor, but it's an EQ, so it doesn't have crossover points that won't work when you use it parallel, uh, and it's a great tool. Thanks very much for all the questions, and uh, hopefully I will see some of you here at Studio La Fabrique at Mix with the Masters next year. Au revoir!